Okay, well, welcome to the Encephalitis podcast. We've got a really special treat today in the shape of screenwriter Abby Morgan. Listeners will be um, familiar with Abby's work. She's the writer behind Shame, Suffragette, The Iron Lady, and the BBC series The Spit, The Split, to name but a few, the latter of which I particularly uh, enjoyed, I have to say. But now she is an author. Abby recently published her first book, called This Is Not A Pity Memoir, which will be of particular interest to our listeners. The book follows the story of her family and her husband, the actor Jacob Krzyzewski, I hope I get uh, get that name right, um, when he develops uh, an MDA receptor encephalitis, Jacob would eventually be put into a coma for seven months, all told, and spend 443 days in hospital with some of our medical and scientific colleagues um, who we work alongside uh, in London. But as many listeners know, when you return home after encephalitis, you and your life don't always return to how they once were. The recovery process continues and as a result of the injury to the brain for some people the person who returns home is not always the same person that left this not only has huge impact of course for them but also perhaps sometimes and more so especially in some cases in the early days for family and friends I'm not exaggerating when I say, and I'm going to show it to you now, I'm not exaggerating when I say I devoured this book. You can see all of my notes here um, that I kept. It's incredibly written, it's profoundly insightful, and at times brutally authentic, but also, as Abby says, not a pity memoir, but a love story. So welcome, Abby. Thank you for joining me on the Encephalitis podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. It's a complete delight. Really appreciate it. Oh, well, we're thrilled to have you. But I guess first things first, how is Jacob? Well, I'm really happy to report that um, in the last sort of six to eight months, he's just made this incredible and very rapid recovery. Um, I think, you know, it's something I'm learning about the condition of encephalitis and you know, there's a really famous um, Buddhist phrase which says, love the flower in winter when it says nothing. And I think we felt like we were living in our winter for a long time with Jacob, you know, that all you could see was just the sort of bare branches and of the man that we knew, but actually so much was clearly going on underneath in terms of cognitive repair. And so for us, it's been, you know, he's in a really good place. I mean, I'm really happy to report it's 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 a place that I think none of us expected even a year ago to get him to that he would get there. Um, but he's now his our last carer left at the end of March. He's self sufficient. He's living at home. Obviously, there are you know cognitive and physical deficits um, which he's working on to overcome. Which you know I'm really happy to talk about. Um, but also, like you say, he's he's very much himself and he's also very different. And I think I'm still and we as a family are still trying to understand that and navigate that at the moment. So, you know, he's 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 got his same wit, his warmth, his intelligence absolutely flooding back. Um, and he's starting to do the things he loved, you know, in 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 the spring we went skiing and we never thought we'd get him on a ski slope again, let alone in the, into a pair of ski boots. And though he was a little wobbly and certainly not the kind of incredible skier he was before, we got him down a mountain and that was pretty amazing. Um, he started to play tennis and that's amazing. He's riding a bicycle. So, you know, lots of things that we didn't expect have come back. And so, yeah, he's in a good place really. And he's very aware of the book and what, you know, that this story has been out there and we're talking about it and, and uh, yeah, it's good. It's good relief I guess that's amazing we we love a good news story particularly in encephalitis of course not everybody's outcomes um are positive but I think it's really good to hear that because it does offer hope for people for the future mm. but you also mentioned the family there and, and I think that's something that we sometimes um don't tend to to ask around perhaps as much as we should so I'm going to ask you how are you and Jesse and Mabel and of course Styler the dog oh uh, well I mean you know, I've never been more grateful for the kind of fortitude of my children and, and the warmth of my dog. Who knew the unconditional love of a dog could carry you through? But I mean, my gosh, he's totally carried us through, not only as a family, but he was a really important part of Jacob's early rehab. I think I think the dog was probably the first human connection he had above anything. Or, or, 
And, you know, I think you forget that the kind of imprint that we leave on our lives and we build, you know, be the physical house and the relationships we form, you know, just being in the company, just the muscle memory of that has been so important. But to, to, I'm circumnavigating that question, how are we? I feel like as a family, I think on a personal level, but as a family as well, I think myself and Jesse and Mabel, you know, when Jacob collapsed, they were 14 and 16, and now they're 18 and 20, four years have passed. Um, and I think anybody who's gone through this, this experience, I imagine this may be familiar, which is there is a feeling that the children and I went through one experience and Jacob has gone through a completely different experience. Um, and we're at the moment, we're trying to calibrate and reconcile those two. The main thing I feel, feel like, I feel like we have life saved Jake and dragged him with a growing sense of him kicking and thrashing and helping us to the side of, you know, to the beach or to the, you know, the edge of the sea or whatever, onto the onto dry land. And we've gotten onto dry land. And I think we are all now going, okay, all right, okay, wow, okay. And we're kind of exhaling and just sort of trying to find ourselves. So in many ways, it's a huge relief. We've got him to where he is. It's amazing and, you know, a real tribute to how hard he's fought to get himself there because my gosh, he's fought to get himself there. Um, but it's it's got a new level of complexity, which I, I, I think I'm trying to understand, which is how do you now reconcile a family and how do you bring together something which has been quite broken actually? How do you bring together you know, a group of people who inherently have all gone through quite a different experience. So whilst communally we've all been working to get Jacob through this, you know, for Jacob, he was in a coma mm. for, you know, seven months going, you know, and, um, and you know, I, I oscillate around the coma state because, you know, it was kind of six to seven months, but because he was in a medically induced coma, he went in and out, you know, it took time to draw him out of that coma. But actually he's sort of taken another two and a half years on top of that to start to come out of the state of encephalitis, you know, the physical, um, you know, the physical experience. And so a lot of those memories, he just has no recall of them, you know, and, and it's interesting to try and help Jacob understand his timeline as well, you know, um, because I think he's having to adjust to the fact that the kids aren't, you know, they're, they're growing up. They're, you know, my son is no longer a teenager. My daughter is no longer 14. She's 18 and about to go off in a gap year. And when he left her, you know, she was, she hadn't even started her GCSEs, you know, she was, she was still the baby of our family. So, uh, you know, I, I imagine it would, re it will resonate for people who've gone through that, that actually you are all changed as well by the experience. So not only, oh, not only has time passed, but we are also individually changed by the experience. You know, it, I defy anyone to come out of this not changed in some way. And, and yet for Jacob, I think time has been kind of suspended. So that's one of the things that we as a family are sort of helped starting. I feel like we've entered a new phase, one that we're incredibly grateful for and one that we never thought we'd get to. But it definitely um, is going to demand some thinking and some healing and some negotiation. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to take time. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah, you don't realise how long it takes. You know, it takes a long. It's four years. It's over four years since Jacob collapsed. Yeah. And you just, you know, it, it, the repercussions of it. I mean, I refer in the book to this idea of a pebble being dropped and there are ripples and those ripples still go on from the experience, you know? Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. Do you remember the first hearing the word encephalitis? I remember hearing it years ago in relation to um, a child, actually, and they're kind of you know, a child in neonatal unit who had developed encephalitis. So I remember reading, a, seeing a documentary or reading in some way about that. Um, I think when, when, you know, when Jacob first collapsed, so Jacob, you know, I talk about it in the book, but, you know, Jacob collapsed with a brain seizure um, and I found him on the bathroom floor in June 2018. And so ensued a kind of two week unraveling, both sort of cognitively, psychiatrically, emotionally, physically of Jacob. Um, well, the doctors try and worked out what was what was happening to him and words like meningitis and viral meningitis and infection were very much in the ether interestingly encephalitis only really came when when a very young consultant went actually I think I've seen this before and I think it's a, a quite a rare form of encephalitis anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis 
otherwise known as Brain on Fire. And I had heard of Brain on Fire. I'd read a book years ago about a, a young woman in America, I think a journalist actually who did experienced it. And, um, and so that put a context to what was happening to Jake very quickly. Um, but it was relatively, it was interesting in terms of the medical um, community because encephalitis wasn't a word that, that was particularly pricked my conscience in the first few days. And now it would be one of the first things I'd ask. And one of the things that's interesting, you know, I've recently gone on social media um, as a result of the book, really. And um, a few people have contacted me or I've started to look on Twitter and they've described, you know, a medical crisis that's happening. And I think, you know, I, I got the name Dr. Google in my family because I Googled everything. And I think the danger is, you know, you can't really, you know, the consultants are the best people to diagnose this. But, you know, there has been someone recently and I'm thinking, I thought, God, that sounds like encephalitis from the, you know, from from the breakdown of someone saying, you know, what they're experiencing. I thought that sounds so to me like an encephalitis. Um, and so I've added it into the mix of people going, well, have you checked this? Have you checked that? You know, and, and uh, but I didn't have that information myself at the time. So mm -hmm. it's definitely been. Um, it's definitely something I'm now exploring and I just feel like I'm starting to understand encephalitis because of course there are so many different kinds of encephalitis as well um, and that feels like a gamut of of new research for me I'm not, you know and as a dramatist you know my starting point is research and source material so you know I, I can see that it's going to creep into my work somewhere this you know yeah, well, you know, I said in the introduction, Jacob was put in a in a coma for several months, which of course is difficult enough. But when he emerged, it became apparent over time that he was experiencing a syndrome called Capgras syndrome, mm -hmm. um, and this is where the person believes often a family member, a member of their family, in this case, you, Abby, um, is an imposter. Um, that was his perception. That was his belief, mm -hmm. and the book focuses a large part on how horribly difficult that was for you lurching I think I, I think I would describe it correctly but but you know you can correct me lurching from almost shame and embarrassment um, for you um, through to a, a sort of horror a fear mm. um, you know can you tell us a bit more about that yeah I mean I, you know I think as a dramatist um you know, I was I was I was acutely aware that what was happening in front of me was a very real drama and that and, you know, and, you know, going through a coma, it didn't look like the coma I'd seen on the movies. No one tells you how, how active the experience of coma is. But, you know, invariably through the conversations, you know, as a family and with friends we had was, you know, the kind of cliche of, gosh, you know, the moment when he wakes when someone wakes up from a coma. What if they don't know who you are? And I had dismissed that. Um, but when Jacob initially woke, you know, one of the things that was amazing, and of course, you know, it took it took a few weeks for him to fully wake, but it became apparent very quickly that he was tracking people in the room with his eyes, which was a very good sign. Um, he was on a ventilator and he had a tracheotomy. And as that, you know, as he came off the ventilator and then eventually came off the tracheotomy, he was able to start to speak. And though his voice was very changed, it was very gravelly. Um, he felt much, he had much more of a London accent than he had before. Um, you know, he was undoubtedly, you could see that Jacob was in there. And though, he, you know, Jacob's, you know, Jacob's big um, kind of symptom, you know, one of the kind of problems he had when he first worked was that he had no agency or initiation and things. So he was quite quiet unless you asked him a question, but when you asked him a question, he would respond. And so initially, I think we were all kind of punching the air because he was back. We could see he was there. Um, there was a lot, you know, obviously phys physically, cognitively, he had a long, long way to go, but we started to move in the phase of prepping to go into rehab and the hope of rehab. But I started to realise a kind of couple of weeks in that something wasn't quite right in the way that he was responding to me. And at first I thought, well, you know, he seemed irritated. He would look at me a bit quizzically. He would seem, you know, he'd ask me occasionally to leave the room when family arrived and I would be slightly bemused by it. And then it really was distilled, you know, and I talk about it in the book, but it was distilled when on Valentine's Day, I bought him a really cheesy red cellophane heart. And I went in and tied it on the end of his bed. And I kind of went, you know, happy Valentine's honey. And he looked at me and I saw a look of embarrassment in his face because and a kind of like this, why are you giving me a balloon and a very sweet nurse, you know, all the nurses have bought these red roses for all the, you know, the 
the wives or the families of patients that day and she said you know Jacob Jacob you know give 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 your give your wife the rose and he said she's not my wife and even then you know at that time Jacob and I weren't married and I was like oh well he means my he means his girlfriend that was but actually it, it, it shook me and I talk about this feeling I felt very shaken by it and very quickly you know from that point I started to say Jacob do you know who I am and he went I have no idea who you are you know, and it became very quickly that not only did he not know who I was, he knew that Abby Morgan, his wife, existed, but that I was an imposter and I was impersonating Abby Morgan, as he would call it. I was known as Abby, but I wasn't Abby Morgan. And then, you know, I think one of the things that really exposed also Jacob's confused thinking was what I would I asked him, well, where is Abby Morgan? And he would say she's gone away. She's got a new life with someone else. So there was already a kind of confabulation now, you know, a kind of um, telling of a story, I think, to make sense of this very changed perception. And the thing about cat gras delusion, you know, it's, as you said, it's the belief in doubles and it can sometimes even be your house, it can be a dog, but it's normally the person you're closest to. Um, you know, one of the elements is they think it's a, it's a disconnect between an emotional reaction to someone and a visual stimulus. So. It, it quite simply Jacob looked at me and didn't feel anything and I think that was the hardest thing to go from being someone with someone who was very demonstrative and affectionate and you know it was a real marriage we definitely had our ups and downs we had our fights we had our moments but it was very consciously affectionate and warm and to see someone look at me and see the fear and mm. the belief that I was a stranger was very sobering and at first, you know, I think I went through every emotion. I, as I, you know, I describe, I used to say to people, can you feel the underground? I can feel the underground. Can you feel the underground? And it was only as I was walking down the stairs and I started to grip the walls, I realized, oh no, it was me that was shaking. Um, and then I went through everything, you know, I bartered, I, I got very depressed, I got angry, I challenged everybody. I found it very funny. It started to become comical. You know, I, there's a famous day where, um, there were these wonderful readers who would come in and read and there was one woman who would come in and read to him and and she said jake should we read your book today and he went yes and he went could you leave please to me and i saw it was the book that i'd given him the fa his favorite book i gave him for christmas and i bought it, i bought the book in and um but it it, it was you know the the nature of capgras delusion and, and what you advised at the time was not to dispute it so to work on this thing called theory a theory b which theory a jacob you know 100 you're right it's not abby and morgan you know you're right but theory b we can never be 100 of sure of anything so what if there was just one percent it could be can you work with that and the idea is that every day you build that one percent to two percent to five percent to just didn't work for him and one of the things that they said was if if it doesn't come back in three months it's likely to stay and three months passed and it was still resolutely there so I think, you know, a lot of about what I write about is, you know, not only Jacob's identity be, ent identity being exploded, but and our identity as a family, but my identity quite literally, because he didn't understand who I was. Um, but then there was just this one very clear moment where I saw, I caught him in the hallway once we finally came home, catching his reflection. And I saw in that moment that he looked at himself really quizzically and I said, who is that Jacob? pointing at his reflection he went I don't know and it was a real turning point for me because I suddenly realized okay it's not that he doesn't know me he doesn't know himself and in fact when you don't know yourself then you turn to the person you know best and you go who am I and I think because he didn't know who he was he then lost all security in me and so that's what I've sort of told myself on a kind of psychiatric level happened and so I guess the book is about me trying to understand who we were as a couple because it challenged who we were as a couple, um, who we were as a family, um, and who we he was as my partner, my lover, my best friend. And so the book is also a reflection on our relationship. And you know it's funny when 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 I came up, and I have to be honest, I didn't come up with the title. It was one that my book agent said, you know, you've got to call it this is not a pity memoir. And if you read the book, it becomes clear why it's called that. Um, but actually, I didn't think it was a love story, but everybody came back and went, you know, you've written a love story. And it was only really when I read it back, finally, you know, months, months later, after I'd sold the book, I went, I thought, yeah, it is. It is a love story. And, and I think when someone close to you goes through a medical crisis, 
you know, the one thing you have to hold on to is sometimes an unconditional nonverbal love. And so, you know, the book is also about how you hold on to the person you love the most when they reject you and also their own mortality is, is really in question. So, yeah, I guess that's what, you know, that's why I explore it so deeply in the book. Yeah, well, there's certainly um, uh, there's certainly a lot of lessons I think for us all um, in the book. Uh, you talk at several uh, points in the book about yourself also feeling like an imposter in in your own life, and 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 I I find um, um, I think many women would agree that this is a perspective that's often attributed to to women. Did you recognise this as you wrote the book, or had you always been aware of feeling that way? You know, I think anybody who, who reaches a level of success, and that can be in any sphere, you know, you know, when you pass something and perhaps you'd ever hoped for yourself or dreamed for yourself, and, you know, and I don't think that's just in the creative arts, it can be in, you know, medicine, it can be in education, it can be in normal day-to-day -day life as a mother, as a parent, you know, I think we all sometimes go, am I, am I getting away with this? Is this are people really, you know, is, is it, am I, am I good enough for this? Um, so I guess it's something I certainly experienced on a professional level. Um, and I think on a personal level, in any relationship, you question, you know, you have days where you think, certainly as a mother, my God, I've questioned myself. But I think nothing, I don't think I will ever go through a more challenging period in my life as going through the last four years has been. And, I, and that's, and also I think as a, as a globe, we've gone through it, you know, we've just gone through a global pandemic, um, which we just touch upon at the end of the book. But but you know that that notion of being an imposter in one's life, I think one of two things happened for me was that I literally became an imposter. I was being told I was an imposter, and there, you know, suddenly I had to fight back. You know, I had to internally fight back to keep my sanity. I had to fight back to try and regain Jacob's trust, love, relationship. I had to fight back to hold together a family because of, you know, this was not only acutely painful for me, but it was acutely painful for both mine and Jake's family to see this happen, you know, particularly as, you know, you, you know, I, I, we were, I, you know, the book is really also just a love story to our, to both our families and our friends who know the consultants, the doctors, everybody who helped us through this, but undoubtedly, you know, a partner, a lover, a mother, a, you know, a, a brother, a sister, at some point you, you become the main advocate. And I was Jake's advocate. And there was something very perverse about being an advocate for someone who didn't believe you were entitled to be there, you know? And so I had to find a place with Jacob. And in a way, Jacob helped me because Jacob very quickly and quite early on decided that I must be working for the state and that I must have been employed to this by the state to come and help him and his family and his children and look after his children. And and I went, yeah, you're right, Jake, I have. I'm here because the state's employed me. And is that OK if I come and hang out with you and help you get better and help look after your children? And he 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 settled on that. And he went, yes, thank you. That's really kind of you. Thanks for doing that. And and so that's, you know, I, I, I had to sort of play that role. And, you know, inevitably the book is, I'm a screenwriter. You know, that's my natural default setting. So the book is also seen through the eyes of a screenwriter. And so, you know, you know, consultants became characters and the dialogue even of my children became you know some an interesting you know moment or lines in a in a in a in a in a scene a shootable scene and but it was very weird I never put myself in the center of a drama and you know I still wrestle about whose story this is is it Jake's story is it mine or is it is it our story as a family and I think you know, when you experience encephalitis, you, you asked early on how are we as a family and that I think families are often overlooked that Jacob has been profoundly changed, but we have been profoundly changed and the ecosystem of our family has been profoundly changed. So we've all been imposters at some point or another in, a, in, a, in an experience of life that in a breakage in our life that none of us wanted. And it makes you dig deep and really start to work out who you are. So I was thinking this morning, actually, I was trying to think of reframe this experience and go, I need to stop thinking about all we've lost. And I need to start thinking about how, how we can grow from this and what growth can come from this. Because, you know, in the worst of times, in order to survive it, you have to dig deep and start to, you know, work on the best of yourself and, and draw on the best of others. And that's, that's definitely where we are at now as a family.
Yeah, and and I, you know, in my experience, um, having worked with people affected by the condition over, over the last twenty five years, that that will come. It's part of the journey. Um, if that gives you any <laughs> any reassurance, it, it it will come over time. But I think that there's an irony that you became, um, in some ways, an actor in in your own life. Um, and you've touched upon the issue of identity and, and memory. Um, and we know that the memory is profoundly fallible. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm always fascinated by how two people can have the same experience, but describe mm -hmm. it vastly differently uh, later. And I also noticed this in your in your screenwriting. Um, mm -hmm. What are your thoughts around that? I know we touched on, on it earlier, but. You know, I was brought up by storytellers. You know, my mum was an actress and my dad was an actor. So I always knew that, um, and I would, you know, my dad ran theatre, so from a very early age, I watched plays, you know, and I've definitely, and I watched masses of telly. I think, you know, we're probably not of a dissimilar generation. And, you know, my generation, it was the electric babysitter. You know, the TV would go on on Saturday morning and probably wouldn't go off till Sunday evening, you know, and I would eke out those last moments before I went to school. So. Um, I think, you know, I've always, you know, I think I've always sort of, you know, drawn on stories and narratives and ways of framing an experience. I've also, you know, it's a very strange experience for me because in some ways I feel like the book has slightly landlocked us and left us, you know, somewhere else because no one tells you, you know, it's an ever changing, evolving landscape and cephalitis and, and the world has changed with it and we've changed with it. And so, um, the narrative doesn't end there, but I, I found the act of writing incredibly therapeutic. And it, you know, I, I often hear about writers saying it pulled out of me. And I always think, God, it doesn't pour out of me. I mean, I, I, I've never had writer's block, but I've certainly, you know, my, I think my, I always feel like my writing is a constant, you know, and certainly screenwriting, there's a kind of mathematical element to it. And I'm terrible at maths, you know, and there's a sort of shifting Sudoku game to play about structure and I'm terrible at Sudoku. So, I have to kind of instinctively work and try and learn along on the job. Um, but this book, you know, it came, I started writing the book um, really during the start of the second lockdown. The first lockdown was, a, I think, you know, in the kind of March, 2020. Um, but actually, we, and actually the first lockdown, you know, obviously globally it was horrific, but actually we were going into the summer, we were making sourdough bread, I was growing vegetables, you know, it was actually my kids were, you know, had a kind of extended holiday at home. And in a way it was quite good for us because we regrouped together and we had to be at home together. And, and I, I was able to spend a lot of time with Jacob along with the carers so I could be there. But actually that second lockdown as we went into winter was, I started to feel very, I found that the harder lockdown and also the reality and the reality of what Jake was and where we were going with Jake was very difficult. And so I found myself once the kids were in bed, once Jake was asleep, you know, I found myself sitting at the kitchen table and it literally pulled out of me. And I think the book does, someone described it as an emotional vomit. And, and I think there is a kind of, you know, certainly in those first hundred pages of the book is a huge, it's got real velocity to it. Um, because I think I was writing the experience out and it was pouring out of me. I think the second half of the book is more reflective and actually that really captures that journey home and bringing Jacob home and that transition, um, you know, and, 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 and steering Jacob through that experience, you know. And then of course, you know, you know I had my own medical, um, you know, crisis. So, that was something that then well, I was going to come on to that <laughs> yeah. actually you know there you are um in this story you know you and the family clinging on by your fingernails and you're suddenly diagnosed with breast cancer during Jacob's illness yeah. I mean I genuinely genuinely can't imagine how you felt or how you coped but but I, what was it that stopped you completely imploding at that point um I think my children, I think the need, you know, I think there's something glorious and brilliant about children's um, joy de vivre and that feeling that we were one parent down and how could I do this to them? Um, but I, I think on a really profound level, nobody told me, and this says more about my vanity than anything, how humiliating um, illness can be. 
you know, and I really work and believe in um, the power of vulnerability now and the importance of vulnerability and letting yourself be infallible and vulnerable. So when I was diagnosed with cancer, I think I'd been sitting there going, oh, I'm, 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 I've got this licked. I can do this. I can look at me, look at me. And there is something very adrenalized actually when you are in the middle of a drama like that, you know, and, you know, two things were going on with Jacob. It was very exhausting. And at times it was very adrenalizing. And I certainly think that's where my narrative head came on. And I started to write down the experience. But when I was, was hit, I physically, you know, it's grueling as anybody who's gone through cancer and certainly cancer treatment, it was grueling. And I had developed um, triple negative cancer, which is quite a rare form of cancer. It's not, it's, it wasn't genetic based in any way in my case. You know, I, you know, I, I, ended, I had a six centimeter tumor in my left breast. And so I went through, you know, 24 weeks of chemotherapy and, um, you know, proceed, you know, uh, uh, then a mastectomy and then um, radiotherapy. And so you, there is nothing you can do but lean into the people you love you. And, you know, a lot of people, one of the things that have come back from everyone is, who read it has said to me, my God, I don't think I've got that many people, that many friends and family in my life who loved me. You probably do have actually, because I think, yes, I was very fortunate to have my children who were so amazing. I mean, really amazing. And, you know, I, I watch them carefully now and know that there's therapy to come because you can't hold that forever. Um, but both Jake and my family, whilst at times it was testing of all of us, they were absolutely amazing and we had them. But it was the neighbor, it was the friend, it was the person I didn't know who cared, it was the consultant, it was the nurses, you know, all of them. And this is why I get emotional, you know, but yeah, I couldn't you you have to allow yourself to be looked after and I wasn't I am not good at that um and you have to allow yourself to be broken and I was pretty broken and you have to allow yourself to lie on the sofa because you can't get up you know you have to lie down when you have chemo or you have to you know I kept on thinking there's something weirdly connected chemo at times made me think about breastfeeding you know when, when you're when you have a child you have to sit and breastfeed it and you have to tend to someone else and chemo, you have to sit and allow these drugs to tend to you. And so whilst it was not wanted and I, you know, I wish none of this had ever happened to us. It's not without its gifts. And one of the things it made me do is it made me stop and it made me say, you, nobody, you know, is, can be strong forever and nobody is uh, immune to to needing to be looked after and to needing to be vulnerable. And weirdly, my daughter said the other day, we were around the table and we were laughing and she was saying, Mama, do you remember, you know, when you came back after your mastectomy, she said you were still so high off the anesthetic and I had to feed you. And she, the, the joy, the way she said, I had to feed you. And I realized that there is a gift in allowing people to look after you. There was a gift in that, allowing her to go, Mom, can I look after you in that moment? Now, I didn't want her to be a permanent carer for me or, but particularly for Jake, because the other thing that happened was I needed to fight, you know, to stay alive. And I'm very, I don't like those phrases like fight and warrior and winning the battle, because I think it makes, it, it means, you know, it, it, it says something about people who don't survive that. They didn't fight any harder than someone who does survive it. So I think, but I think it, you dig deep. And we just, I got lucky. I got lucky with the constellation of friends, family, drugs consultants luck you know and I got through it um but it, I, it you it only you have to lean in and I had to lean really far into everybody who loved me and helped and hold me and and weirdly you know I think one of the things it did for Jacob and I you know every, a lot of people said well of course you look different you you know you, you had no hair but you know Jacob you know it was when I did have hair he, he he stopped remembering me when I didn't have hair I think one of the things that was really difficult for Jake was he couldn't understand why he was so punctured by this lady who was helping him from the state by this person he didn't know he couldn't work out why he felt so sad for me and why he cared so much and I think you know part of that you know what happened to me started to puncture Jake and I remember one day he he was he found it very difficult to get up and down the stairs and I was lying on the sofa having my chemotherapy I was very fortunate I had my chemotherapy at home unusually um 
and I could hear this, these footsteps coming up the stairs, very slowly shuffling up the stairs. And I just saw him come in and put his head around the door and look at me. And I said, are you okay? And he went, just checking. And I realized in that moment that he cared. He cared about what was happening to me and it was confusing him, but it was also awakening something in him. So whilst I wish it had, hadn't happened, it did. Um, it definitely started to wake him up a bit to what was happening to me. And it, it, it was another kind of pebble dropping into the kind of ocean of damage and, and, and his illness that, that I think was part of why he started to look at me a little more differently and started to recognize something in the way he felt about me. Mm. Yeah, his love for you being, you know, really deep and at the core of his being, as you say, he was feeling something. He didn't really know why, but he, he felt mm. something mm. that's, you know, um, amazing. Mm. You talk in the book, I, I was struck by uh, the temporality of health and illness that you touch upon in the book. There was there was a, a specific bit in the book where you're reflecting and saying well we all want the old the old Jacob back you want life back as it used to be but then you have this realization that time is as you put it pulling you forward that you can't go backwards and that forwards this new life was the only option for you and that was such an important moment for me because I think that moment happens for people at different points in in, the, in their journey um do, do you remember do you remember that i mean obviously you've written about it in the book but do you do you remember that it was it was such such a poignant moment for me in the book yeah no i do remember that and i think it's not necessarily one moment i think it's a philosophy you know and it's and it's interesting hearing you say that again because it's it you know there is you know every kind of emotion goes through this experience and grief is one of them you know grief for the life that we had grief for the four years that have been lost, you know, grief for Jacob and the experiences that have been lost and the time he had with his children. You know, he's come back and one of, you know, our son is at university, our daughter is about to leave home and he's just ready to spend time with them. Um, and I, so it's something I have to check in on with myself the whole time, but because life is, is pulling us forward, you know, children, you know, the great joy of children is they do grow up and my children are just at the start of some of the great moments in their life, I hope. And, uh, and, you know, I think some of the things that Jake and I are experiencing at the moment is what you experience anyway, when your children start to leave home, you know, the kind of slightly empty nest syndrome. I think one of the things that, you know, Jacob's medical crisis and, and my cancer has done for me is that, um, and I talk about a lot in the book is how close to the cliffs I felt we got and how close to drowning I think we both were. And so I have a huge respect for my own mortality. You know, I, I, joke, I joke about the fact that I'm someone who lives with deadlines, but I'd forgotten about the greatest deadline, which is our death. And that whilst I try not to live on a day-to-day -day level that death is around the corner, I don't take for granted. And it's a very active thing that I work for work with and at times it's really hard you know at times you go back to all those things you start to moan about the basics in life and you know social media is both a brilliant and terrible thing I mean who knew that you could scroll through Instagram and suddenly feel huge envy for some huge beautiful new house in the Hollywood Hills and think what I'm such a failure that I don't have this house but you know so all the old rubbish comes back in but actually the truth of it is you know, if you've had a breast cancer diagnosis every day, you feel lucky to have. And, you know, you know, not to play the kind of game of statistics, but, you know, I, mine is triple negative and it's one of the most aggressive cancers. And so I try and rather feel than feel intimidated by that, I just try and say what I have had so far is enough. If this is all I get, it's enough. And every other day is a bonus. And 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 it does mean it does give a certain energy to my life and it does give a certain you know, my brain is working quite hard at the moment to work out how I want to live every day and to actively enjoy my life and to help Jake enjoy his life. And, you know, one of the great surprises is that I don't have to work at that with Jacob. You know, Jacob has come back with such a strong sense of second chance. You know, it's a bit like being with someone who's gone through some kind. Of, I mean, I talk about, you know, one of his psychiatrists referred to Jake's cat grass. It's like a religious conversion. It's that deep. But actually, I feel like Jake has gone through another kind of religious kind of awakening, which is almost like, wow, I want to live my life now. So, 
you know, his, his joy de vivre and his desire to see, watch, do is just absolutely at the forefront of every day for Jacob. You know, even, even choosing his favourite salami is joyful for Jacob or, you know, his beloved football, which has now extended to women's football. I mean, he is such a fan and they're like, he's such a football pundit now. His day-to-day -day conversation is very punditry. Um, you know, there is a joy to that and you can only look at that and try and be inspired by that and be motivated by that and but I do think there's something very important in what you're saying which is there is so much attention paid to the person who is ill and I talk about myself as well and I now I'm really looking about what do other about giving to other people but also giving to myself you know you do have to you know the kids and I are pretty tired out and I want my daughter to go and travel and I want my son to enjoy his last you know university but I also need to spend a bit of time and work out what I need now and what I want now um, because, and I'm led in that example by Jacob, because, you know, Jacob so nearly lost himself and he's regained himself. And now he, he really does enjoy life. He really does go for life every single day. And I want to be inspired by that and not be, um, yeah, I want to be inspired by that and motivated by that. Has he read the book, Abby? No, he, he hasn't. And it's ironic really, because, you know, throughout the book, I'm often talking to him. I'm talking to the person I knew. I'm talking to the Jacob who is now. Um, and so in many ways, he was the audience I wrote it for. But, and I don't know if he ever will. He's very supportive of it. You know, I definitely, when the book was about to come out, I had a massive wobble and I turned to him and went, what have I done? What have I done? What am I doing? And he was the first person to say, well, you know, you've spent your whole life writing about everyone else's life it's about time you wrote about your own so he's always been the advocate for truth you know there are times where I worry about what he'll think about the book I you know it's brutal as you say it's honest but what I know about Jacob to be true is that he's one of the most tenacious honest direct people I know and he always advocated for for me to be bold and to write about what I felt and to say what I feel and I think he would, he's proud of me. He's proud of me. And I think one of the things that's been interesting about the book is, you know, it was important that I got the approval of Jacob's family, my children, my family, anyone else who's in it. But, um, you know, it's allowed us to start to talk a little bit about what's happened to him because, you know, he's seen, he's been in photo, he's done some press photographs with me and he's listened to the odd bit of snippet on the radio or he's heard, seen the odd podcast or certainly social media. So he's aware it's out there. But, you know, again, it's also part of the experience, which is you don't necessarily go through the same experience. And for Jacob, that's the past. He doesn't want to go there. It's very difficult for him to go there. Um, he's very focused on going forward. And I think maybe when he is ready, he will read it. But I don't think he'll read it in the, in the near future. No. Mm. Well, I can answer the question. Um um you said you wondered what what have you done in writing the book well I, I can tell you you've you've given a lot of people a great gift um and I want you know I want you to know that um because it, it, it is a wonderful wonderful book um can we expect to see more of your work on the small or big screen perhaps an adaptation of the book Abby yeah, can we persuade I mean you at all yeah, I mean, I'm definitely, you know, you know, I work a lot with uh, my production company. I work with a lot with Sister Pictures, which is a fantastic production company led by Jane Featherstone. And she's my kind of artistic collaborator in everything screen. Um, and, you know, the plan is that I will adapt this into a film of some kind. And I certainly want to, I've started directing something that's come out of this as I've started to direct. Um, and I would like to you know, I'd like to try and capture the experience that's in the book, but also I think there's a bit more of the story to tell. Um, so it's certainly something I'm looking at developing and the hope is that it will become a film in some way and it will be on the screen. And But I want it not just to be a vanity piece. I want to use it, you know, in the same way as the book was pushing something forward in me. I think a film or any adaptation of the book has to push forward a little more. You know, I have adapted books, other people's novels, you know, um, for the screen, you know, um, I've done, you know, book about, you know, the lover of Charles Dickens and, um, you know, I've adapted, you know, the, I've, I've talked about Margaret Thatcher and, you know, I've done every kind of, I've done books about, you know, uh, you know, adapted 
you know, research documents around sex trafficking. So it's probably a natural progression, but I want it to move beyond the book. And, and I also really want to understand the purpose of it, you know, not just, you know, I'm a dramatist, so totally, you know, the book, you know, originally I was going to, I wanted to write the book as a play because I had this idea that we could start to use it as part of Jake's therapy. And then when lockdown happened, I wrote it as a memoir, but invariably what I realized was, I always look at everything through the prism of screen. So it is a natural place for it to kind of eventually end up. And I love the quiet political nature of the screen, but also the small screen TV, because, you know, we watch, we watch in every kind of form now. We watch on our computers, we watch in the cinema, we watch on our phones. Um, and I hope there's something in the book and something in the telling of this story. So, I mean, it genuinely, you know, moves me to know if it means something because there are times where you just think this is just such a small life, particularly now we've hit a global pandemic and, you know, things that, you know, you look at what's happening in the Ukraine and Myanmar and, you know, there are so many different bigger stories. And also I'm connected to many people who are in that hospital still who have been, you know, still going through their own experiences and it's one story and, and uh, it's, you know, it's one small life, but I hope it can resonate in some way. And I, uh, and, and and have a bit more of a kind of universal appeal or certainly mean something beyond just the kind of myopic detail and domesticity of what we went through, you know? Um, so yeah, I hope it will become, it will end up on the screen in some way, yeah. Well, I, I can't wait for that. I'm, I'm going to start planning my my outfit now for the, uh, for the <laughs> red carpet. <laughs> <will definitely>, um, <laughs> Um, look, we're nearing the end of the podcast, Abby. Um, I'm going to switch things a little bit on you before we finish up and ask you um, some Desert Island Disc moments. Yeah. Um, so your first question, you've got um, four questions. Um, your first question is favourite book and why? You know what? There are so many great books. And I, you know, I talk about in the book that I often re read reviews of books and then pretend I've read them because a lot of books I read for work. But I really thought about this and I thought actually some of the most seminal work for me, and you're going to laugh at this, is the Judy Bloom books that I read when I was a teenager. And I, the reason why I thought about it a lot now is that, you know, one of the things that I wish hadn't happened was that my children's teenage life hadn't been punctured in the way it was. But the one thing I take away is a kind of hope that they will have an emotional resilience and robustness from it. And what I loved about Judy Bloom's books was, you know, beyond the world of Super Fudge and the younger books, was that the older books were really about the start of, of teenage life, but also the sense and an awakening of, of a world beyond it. So I would probably want the complete collection of Judy Bloom books if I could take them away because, and I advocate them for any teenager or young person to read. So they would be my Desert Island Disc books. And actually as someone who's done Desert Island Discs, this is a great moment for me because there were so many things I wish I'd put in there that I didn't get to do. So this is a chance to do that now. You get a second go. Um, yeah. Well, your second question then, favorite singer or band? Oh my God, really difficult. You know, I could have gone from like ABBA to Queen to Elton John, to, but actually um, a Joni Mitchell, massive Joni Mitchell fan. I love both sides now, her album and Blue, my favorite albums. But weirdly I've gone for Guy Garvey, Elbow, the seldom seen kid album, which is just the most beautiful album. And there are one or two songs that are really significant to us as a family, you know, sort of days at music festivals, you know. Um, one day, uh, which is like, you know, one of this beautiful song at the heart about one great day. And and I still remember a memory of us, you know, with my kids at Latitude Festival watching this with Jake when they were little and you can still hold and contain and, you know, you have huge hope for their lives and yours. So um, it's probably that. Yeah, I love, I just love him as a, I think he's an amazing lyricist, writer, storyteller. So I love his work. Yeah. Yeah, agreed. And what luxury item then would you take to your desert island? I would take a piano and one of those okay. either either you know like a piano and one of those like keyboard like this is these are the keys you need to press to play you know knees up mother brown okay. something, whatever it is because I just don't I found writing and the ability to express was so brilliant but I would love to express in a non-verbal way and I love music and I love my kids play the piano you know and I've given them a decade of piano lessons and I never did that myself so I love the idea of being having a piano and just trying to play to the birds if I can so that would be you know piano and a how to play a piano book would be great 
I love that. Well, your um, finally, your last question is: What would be your last meal if you had to choose one? Okay, it would be, and it would be roast chicken because it's probably the thing I do best. But it would be roast chicken, very thin fries, green salad, and really crunchy salt and a lemon. And I just that to me is food at home. You know, that's like my favourite home food. And I think food and cooking was such a comfort to me during everything. And I still, you know, one of the things, one of the things I, I regret most in my life with my children, but I can still think I cook them many good meals is that I love it if we can all get around the table. And I think there were a lot of times where I was on film set, so working late and I wasn't there. And so when I can get them all around the table and particularly now, I wish, you know, I want more meals around the table with them and with Jake and with family. So, uh, but it's gotta be, I don't really, you know, as long as the food is just good, good ingredients, and it's people around eating it. That's all I need. I don't really need anything fancy, but yeah, roast chicken, definitely. Sorry to to, to all vegetarians out there, but it would be roast chicken. <laughs> I think I'll forgive you. Um, roast chicken is the point then at which we're going to conclude um, what has been um, a very pleasurable 45 minutes or so um, with you, Abby. Thank you for joining us. But people, this is not a pity memoir, the title of the book. You conclude that at one point in the book that there perhaps is no such thing. And I think I agree. As you say, if the book offers a hand or embrace to someone Googling in the middle of the night with a loved one's life hanging in the balance, then that is something. The book will do that. But in my humble opinion, um, it should also be read by everyone, if for no other reason than to remind us of the sliding doors of our lives. Um, and that we should tell those closest to us um, that we love them, that we really love them. Um, and as perhaps a reminder of the fragility of our lives. Thank you for this beautiful book, Abby. Um, people can get it from bookstores, Amazon, all the usual uh, outlets and things. Um, thanks for taking the time uh, in joining us today. Um, to the listeners and viewers of the podcast, uh, do please remember that the Encephalitis Society remains at your service. If you need any support or information, um, our teams are there for you. You can go to encephalitis.info for contact details or to chat with any of the team online. Um, we hope that you've enjoyed this podcast. And as always, if you can support our life-saving work, we would be extremely grateful. And you can do that at encephalitis.info forward slash donate. And don't forget to buy the book, people okay until our next podcast everybody Thank you.